Talking Tolkien Podcast, Episode 10, Leaf by Niggle, Part 1, An Introduction. Hi everyone, John Carswell here. Welcome to the Talking Tolkien Podcast, your conversational guide to Middle Earth and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, Greta and I discuss my favorite non-Middle Earth Tolkien work, Leaf by Niggle. I had originally planned to do Leaf by Niggle in one episode, but our conversation about the story itself ran a little longer than planned. Therefore, I am releasing our introductory conversation first, and will be releasing our discussion of Leaf by Niggle itself next week. Enjoy! Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Talking Tolkien Podcast. Um, episode 10, in fact. It ten. is uh, lucky number 10. Yes, Isn't we're in the double ten, digits. 10's a lucky number, right? Uh, sure. Yeah? Yeah. In this case, it is. I feel like, I feel like we're kind of, uh, it's, it's almost like it's becoming old hat now. You know, it's like, it's like, all right, time, you know, time for another Talking Tolkien Podcast. Ain't no thing. It's what we do, it's what you we know? Do. Just the way we roll, it's part of the normal routine, you know? Yeah, I know. But hopefully it doesn't come off as routine when you're listening. No. Uh, no, we want it to be fresh and real. In our in our hearts, Tolkien is anything but routine. Anything but. Yes. Good. You're like that kid from The Sandlot, the younger brother from The Sandlot right now. <laughs> I just realized that. It's <laughs> just repeating. I'm just repeating everything that Repeats you say. Everything, yeah. Exactly. I did expound a little bit earlier, though. I added some um, strong adjectives. Some mm-hmm. quality adjectives in there. Yeah, you should you should go that route more than the little brother from the same lot. Quality route. adjectives and strong verbs. Yes, I'll do it. Good. Um, so episode ten, uh, we're going to again take a little break from the Silmarillion, uh, our our chapter by chapter step through of the Silmarillion, and we're going to look at a work that is near and dear to my heart, one of my absolute um, favorite of Tolkien's works. Um, Leaf by Niggle. Leaf by Niggle is, in fact, uh, my probably. I, I would. I was thinking today. I would definitely tell people that it's my favorite non-Middle Earth Tolkien work. Um, and we're going to see that as we go through and discuss it on this podcast. We're going to see why um, why I think it's so cool um, and and why I think you know it really is so cool. Um, yeah, I've read it twice now. Yeah, and um, both times. I I finish it and I just shake my head. Like it's just it's so just so just, amazing. You're just like I didn't understand any of that. No, quite <laughs> the that, opposite. Was that even English? Actually. Was that no, even English? quite the opposite. It's just like I can't believe that something a story that amazing and that glorious exists. Yes, it really is. Like that's the way I feel when I read it too. It's yeah. um, I, I mean it's um. It's it's funny because it's nothing like the Middle Earth works mm-hmm. at all, um, but it's like this short summary I think of what Tolkien was all about, like almost almost like it you can't you can't really call it an autobiographical story, but it feels a little autobiographical in a way, mm-hmm. um, and I think it but I think it does really reflect so much of what Tolkien was all about, and so um, it's fitting actually that it. It was originally combined, and when it was published as a book, um, it was combined with On Fairy Stories, which is his favorite, um, which which was his foundational essay on on his aesthetic, right? On yeah. on on his view, literary views. We talked about that some. In yeah, and we'll get we'll episodes. at some point we'll actually tackle On Fairy Stories. Um, it's uh, it gets you know it's 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 a little bit academic, so. Um, but not not so academic that it's not readable. Um, but but it, it, this is kind of a fictional version or twist on what he was getting at in on fairy stories is what I think. Hmm, interesting. So um, so yeah. So um, uh, before we dive in, unfortunately, neither one of us could get our. I, I guess it's becoming a little too routine because both of us <laughs> forgot to do our, our haikus. So our apologies. 
Um, maybe we'll do Leaf by Niggle haikus along with whatever haikus we do for the next episode. Just that so sounds we can, good. That sounds that. good. It'll be yeah. like a nice little recap yeah. of the previous episode. Maybe it will get people who haven't listened to mm-hmm. the Leaf by Niggle episode. They're like, oh, that's not about the Silmarillion. I don't care. Yeah. So maybe that is a good idea to put a Leaf by Niggle introduce, you know, to do a, a Leaf by Niggle haiku before we dive into our next Silmarillion episode because yeah. then it'll maybe pique people's interest to. Right, it almost, over it almost feels providential. You almost know what? feels providential. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like a Tolkien thing, too, where how, you know, a negative was going to be used for an even, even greater positive. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Melkor tried to keep us from writing haikus, and mm-hmm. it's just going to come back. And, we are going to show him. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's going to make the music of the Ainur even greater. You know it. All right. Uh, so... Um, the thing, you know, I was thinking as I was reading, um, and I think that actually works out because Leaf by Nagel, there's a lot to say about it. So, there is. Uh, yes. We don't want to make this episode too super long, so we better get started talking about it. Um, so, the thing for me, Leaf by Nagel, I think, has one of the greatest endings to a story ever. Um, I it's almost, it's almost like I can't find the words to express what he's trying to say in, at the end of this story. That's why I just shake my head. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Like, it, it feels profound, but it's beautiful, mm-hmm. and it's it almost is like just this picture that you want to just keep in your mind. These words, it's almost like you just want you want to hear them said over and over again, because they're just mm-hmm. so, they're so wonderful and beautiful and uh, consoling, you know? Um, I didn't write that down, actually, but it comes to mind that that really feels like a um, the the whole notion of consolation as as we'll see later when we talk about on fairy stories is very important to Tolkien. Um, this notion that even though we suffer, even though we suffer loss, and um, uh, even though we don't always accomplish the things in this life that we seek to accomplish, um, that that's not necessary. We don't have to look at that as just a lost cause, an altogether lost cause. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very much at the heart of this particular work. Um, the other th- so before before we actually get into the text itself, though, I wanted to um, speak a little bit about some of what Tolkien wrote in his letters about the story. Um, so, in letter one fifty three in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, he actually basically says this is a story about subcreation. Um, do you remember what subcreation is, Greta? Subcreation. Um, yeah, that's like the creation within a creation, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the basic idea. And, um, you know, it's basically this view where if human beings are creatures made in the image of God, of some original, of some being that underlies everything... Uh, and that is the foundation of everything, then um, we, uh, and that's something that Tolkien, you know, talks about in On Fairy Stories, um, that, you know, he very much ties this back to that Christian view of, of humans being made in the image of God, and that if we are made in the image of God, then we're like him in the way, in our creative in our creative capacity. Right. Right. That our, that our creations reflect him. Right. Yes. Well, not only that they reflect him, but that we, we reflect him and that we create Right? right, that we okay. make things that we, um, you know, we're not, you know, some animals make things because it's like it's like they're wired to make things for survival, right? Right, but they're not; they don't make things just to make beautiful things, right? Right, humans, yeah. be, human beings do that. Right, we make things in order to make beautiful things. Right, and that's that's kind of at the heart of what Tolkien means about subcreation. Um, that there's some there's something about us. Um, that makes us want to be want, makes us want to, to do our own creating like like him whose image we're made in right so um, hmm. so he says in letter 153 near the end of it that letter 153 actually is a really great letter it's about it's a really long one um, and he wrote it to um, Peter Hastings who was a manager of the Newman bookshop it says a Catholic bookshop in Oxford and um, who was a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings and um, and was kind of the original was maybe one of the very first people who was just like one of these people that Tolkien was like, "Whoa, you're taking this even more seriously than I was." <laughs> you know, it was like asking him all these questions about wow. like, you know, 
So, you know, why exactly, you know, why why exactly are elves like this? Shouldn't they be like this? You know, like taking things mm. really to the next level. And, um, I bet of course, loved that. Well, I, I think he did. I think he was a little bit surprised that people went that far, but I think he really genuinely loved it that people did. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he wrote long letters like these yeah. to, to people in response to their questions like that. But anyway, it, it, near the end of this letter, he says... Having mentioned free will, I might say that in my myth, I have used subcreation in a special way. He refer, The myth he refers to is Lord of the Rings. Um, and then in parentheses, he says, not the same as subcreation as a term in criticism of art. Though I tried to show allegorically how that might come to be taken up into creation in some plane in my purgatorial story, Leaf by Nagel. Um, to make, yeah, so um, a few interesting things in that mm. little parent parenthetical mm-hmm. aside there. First of all, he says that um, Leaf by Nagel is a purgatorial story. Right? Yes. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll develop that a little more fully. Um, but he also refers to allegorically. He says allegorically. Right? Um, mm-hmm. That's an interesting thing because elsewhere he... You know, what do you think? Did, did you feel like you were reading an allegory when you read this? I really didn't. Honestly, and at least not the first time. Yeah. The first time I read it, I, I, I really didn't. I felt like I was just reading a story about a, a guy named Niggle and his life and, you know, the ups and downs and, and everything in between. Um, but once I got to the end of it, I began, you know, then, you know, once you finish something, you go back and you review it in your, in your mind. You're like, oh... Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, and that that's when some of maybe the nuances hit me a little bit more, but I still honestly didn't feel like it was, I don't think it was an, ava- I do not feel that it was a very obvious allegory. Let me right. put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because even though he talks about, he uses the word allegory there, obviously, and I think we may have talked about this in one of the first few episodes, Tolkien was not a huge fan of allegory. No. Um, anybody who tried to like say the allegory of the Lord of the Rings is this, you know, that just really, um, uh, he really took issue with that. Right. Um, he, he did not want his stories to be viewed as these allegories for something else. They were very, they had their own primacy. They were their own, uh, they were their own things. Right. Uh, he didn't have a problem with people seeing connections, you know, symbolic connections in certain things. Um, per se, but for him, it was about it was about the thing itself. It was about the the world he was creating in his works. But then you have Leaf by Niggle, and it definitely has this allegorical quality. You know, peop, you know, things feel very symbolic. He doesn't spend a lot of time developing um, the story per se, like the details of the story and all of that per se. Right? Mm. You know, he doesn't like go into this big description of the place that. Um, that niggle lives. Yeah, like the setting, and, or even the characters know. are not extremely well developed. Yeah, yeah. You I mean, have a general idea of what they're like, but they're not. Right. You know, they're not developed to to any. You know, base certainly not to the point that you would need them to be for a novel. But, but I mean, with it being a short story, that's often not even required. Yeah. Really. Well, but it's true, and it's but it's still interesting that Tolkien doesn't. Um, that he doesn't even spend any time doing that, but it's also. Given his um, negative feeling toward, towards allegory, I guess you could say in general, um, the story does definitely have a lot of allegorical qualities. You know, it almost feels like there are things happening that really represent other things. Mm-hmm. And even the names of the two main characters, Niggle and Parrish, feel very symbolic, right? Niggle is not a word we're used to in um, in America, but basically what uh, what to niggle is is to annoy, right? Uh, it's oh, like an annoyance, okay. right? It's something okay. that bugs you. Um, and now he says in one of his letters that perish doesn't have any symbolical um, connotations, no no intentional symbolism in it. He just happened to like the name Parrish and chose that. He actually knew a gardener named Parrish. Okay. And, and so he gave that character that name. That's um, surprising. Yeah. I feel like that has more more symbolic meaning to me than... Well, it, it's interesting yeah, because it actually does come to take on a symbolic mm-hmm. yeah, uh, importance in, at the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, it kind of becomes its own little symbol. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it does so in the course of the story over time. It's not like it just, you, you start right, the story. Right, it doesn't hit you right away. And you're like, oh, no. Parrish really stands for this. You know? Right, right, right. No, that's um, true. That's, that's you true. Know, that's, yeah, it's not until you get really to the, 
very end. Yeah, um, but the you know the other the other interesting thing about him calling it an allegory there is that um, he elsewhere he basically says it's not really allegorical. Um, he actually says it's more mythical than allegorical. Um, and his reason for saying that is that Niggle is meant to be real, not representative, right? So Niggle is meant to be a real person and not just this, like, Niggle stands for this, right? You know, you think, again, mm-hmm. I think, the, like, the ultimate, um, the ultimate allegory would be, like, um, the Pilgrim's Progress, right? Where every, every single thing stands for something else, right? right? Yeah. It's all, it's this long, strung together series of symbols that, that represent the, the life of the Christian, right? Okay. Um, but in this case, Niggle isn't supposed to be, be that. Again, there there are ways in which um, he might reflect, you know, his journey might reflect our journeys, right, right in right. different ways. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily exactly the same. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I I toyed with the idea of maybe thinking it was a fable, or because it, it like myth, it doesn't feel mythical to me because myth to me is like grand myth. Myth involves a lot more in my mind. You know, when I think of right, it, it involves yeah. dragons and uh, wizards and <laughs> right, and like gods and like supernatural things. Right. Yes. Um, you know, yes. a myth almost seems like it should be um, uh, it just it doesn't seem like a myth should be able to fit into a short story. You know, agree. I guess is yeah, what I'm there needs to be more developed. There needs to be yeah. more myth. Substance. Myth just seems too epic. I guess you yes. know a term. When you think of myth, too, I mean, that's really the most ancient form of storytelling that we have record of, mm-hmm. really. I mean, maybe not the most, but it's one yeah. of the more ancient ones. You just think about, you know, Greek myths and Roman myths and, you know, I mean, that's what you think of when you think of myths, is you right. think of this very early and almost a, and again, a, 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 a B.C., right, a before Christ telling, mm-hmm. right? I mean, because mm-hmm. that's why they invented myths in the first place, was to explain the world around them, because they had no, you know, because they had no idea that, that, you know, there was a God, let alone Jesus, right? And so they invented these mythical creatures to explain the sea and the sky and the sun and all this stuff, mm-hmm. right? So anyway, a bit of a rabbit trail, but I guess that's another reason why I, too, would have a hard time seeing Leaf by Nickel as a myth, because I think of myths as very ancient, Yeah, you know, ancient uh, you know stories that people develop to kind of base their their you know to have a framework for their reality. Yeah. No. I I I hear you. And um and and I yeah I I agree. Like it's I think we're basically saying the same thing. Myth is not um myth just feels a little too grand in a way for like the the scope of a myth feels a little too grand. Right. Uh, for for to call Leaf by Niggle a myth. Right. Um, but I was looking to see if maybe there was a better title for better um, genre for maybe a fable or a parable parable mm-hmm. seems like maybe it's maybe a long parable um i like fable well i was reading fate i was reading about fable though and i actually liked fable at first but apparently fable usually involves animals um like, uh, an- like anthropomorphic fable, animals like the, yeah yeah um animals acting like as human beings uh, as human beings animals. might act yeah Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, I didn't that. Um, okay. so maybe parable, but in the end, I guess maybe the best term for it is just a short story. Um, <laughs> you know. Wow. Which we could have made that whole segment of the show so much shorter. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting though because you do hear it. You do hear it. Uh, yeah, if you want to. Sorry, you can so sue us. Um, <laughs> I listened funny. to that whole spiel about stuff, and then you just decided it was a short story. Short story. story. Oh uh, well, that... I feel like short story is not giving it enough credit, though. Yeah, there's it's it's kind of maybe we need to come up with our own term for mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I think that it, it's definitely a story worthy of its own genre. Yeah, maybe we could call it a uh, a talk tale <laughs> instead of a folk tale. A talk tale instead of a folk tale. A talk... Yeah. I kind of like that. Or how about a talk fail? No, but then that, that has no, bad connotations. No, that's a very bad connotation. Yeah, sorry. It's anything but yeah. fail. I don't know. We could, we could pretend like Parish and Niggle are rabbits, and then it could be a fable. And then it could be a fable. Yeah. Does it ever actually say that they're humans? Hmm. I don't think so. Well, it calls him a little man. Yeah. 
But there's man rabbits. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's man. Man could just mean male. Yeah. This, yeah, you know what? Let's, let's keep that in the back of our brains. Yeah. That might actually work. All right. Well, uh, speaking of speaking of rabbit trails, all right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, so one other one other big note on um, as far as letters go, I'm I'm actually going to read a little bit of a passage. So he actually spent um, in one of his other letters um, later on. He he devoted a good bit of space to talking about Leaf by Niggle, and this is like this is like 23 years after he wrote it. Um, let me say a quick thing about him writing it too. Apparently. Tolkien, like, took forever to write things. You know, I think we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Um, The Hobbit came out in 1937, I believe. And The Lord of the Rings wasn't released until 1953. So 16 years between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And he started writing The Lord of the Rings immediately after The Hobbit. Oh, after The Hobbit. So it took him a long time to write The Lord of the Rings. Now, The Lord of the Rings... It's a very long book. Well, it is a long book, but the point is... It, he he himself admits he takes for he took forever to write things, and um, well maybe because he was giving everything for names well, and writing lots of different languages. Yeah, yeah. but the um, but what he says is that Leaf by Niggle was the was the exception. Um, he actually just like woke up one morning in the late thirties, and he I don't know if he had been dreaming this or what, but he just had this idea for this story, and he just like spent the morning writing it down. And what we have is, is he says, is almost to a T exactly what he wrote down. Really? Yeah. In one sitting? In one sitting. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So um, uh, that's really cool in and of itself mm-hmm. because it's almost, you know, it almost makes you think it's like this like very subconscious like dream work of his. Yeah, know? totally. Um, but uh, um, th- so just almost very... divinely inspired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good point too. It's... Uh, very mysterious in that way, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but he wrote this. He wrote. Um, he spent a little time talking about Leaf by Nagel in a later letter to. Um, oh, who was it to? There we go. To Jane Neve, who was his aunt apparently, um, mm-hmm. and so what he says about it. Um, on the right page. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, Bear with me. All right. I am now sending you Leaf by Niggle. I have had a copy made specially to keep it, if you wish, from the Dublin Review in which it appeared nearly 20 years ago. It was written, I think, just before the war began, though I first read it aloud to my friends early in 1940. I recollect nothing about the writing except that I woke one morning with it in my head, scribbled it down, and the printed form in the main hardly differs from the first hasty version at all. I find it still quite moving when I reread it. It is not really or properly an allegory so much as mythical, for Niggle is meant to be a real mixed quality person and not an allegory of any single vice or virtue. The name Parish proved convenient for the porter's joke, but it was not given without with any intention of special significance. I once knew of a gardener called Parish. I see there are six parish parishes in our telephone book. Of course, some elements are in, are explicable in biographical terms, so obsessively interesting to modern critics that they often value a piece of literature solely in so far as it reveals the author, and especially if that is in a dif- discreditable light. Tolkien was not a fan of contemporary um, critics, like of literary critics. Hmm. Uh, there was a great tree, a huge poplar with vast limbs, visible through my window even as I lay in bed. I loved it and was anxious about it. It had been savagely mutilated some years before, but had gallantly grown new limbs. He sounds like uh, he's channeling Ivana here. You know? mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, though of course not with the unblemished grace of its former natural self. And now a foolish neighbor was agitating to have it felled. Every tree has its enemy, few have an advocate. Too often the hate is irrational, a fear of anything large and alive, and not easily tamed or destroyed, though it may clothe itself in pseudo-rational terms. This fool said that it cut off, from the, cut off the sun from her house and garden, and that she feared for her house if it should crash in a high wind. It stood due east of her front door, across a wide road, at a distance nearly thrice its total height. Thus, only about the equinox would it even cast a shadow in her direction, and only in the very early morning once that reached across the road to the pavement outside her front gate. And any mind, and any wind that could have uprooted it and hurled it on her house would have demolished her and her house without any assistance from the tree. I believe it still stands where it did. Though many winds have blown since... 
Uh, also, of course, I was anxious about my own internal tree, the Lord of the Rings. It was growing out of hand and revealing endless new vistas, and I wanted to finish it, but the world was threatening. And I was dead stuck somewhere about chapter 10, the voice of Saruman, in book 3, uh, with fragments ahead, some of which eventually fitted into chapter 1 and 3 of book 5, but most of which proved wrong, especially about Mordor. And I did not know how to go on. It was not until Christopher was carried off to South Africa that I forced myself to write book four, which was sent out to him bit by bit. That was 1944. Um, so he kind of goes on, but the... the um, and then he says at the end, but none of that really illuminates Leaf by Niggle much, does it? If it has any virtues, they remain as such, whether you know all this or do not. I hope you think it has some virtue. But for quite different reasons, I think you may like the personal details. That is because you are a dear and take an interest in other people, especially as rightly your kin. Uh, which is kind of a nice thing to say to his dear dear old aunt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but anyway. Um, so apparently he had trees on the brain. Yeah, that... yeah. He was very much, uh, he had this one tree, a poplar tree apparently, mm -hmm. that he, he just thought he loved and thought was glorious. And he was worried about the tree. But at the same time, he was very... He was growing anxious about um, about Lord of the Rings. Because he felt like um, that was a tree that was growing out of control. Right, right. Uh, of course, he was only very early, I think, in the process of writing it when he would have written Leaf by Niggle. Hmm. Um, but I think he had this sense that it might eventually get out of hand, you know, yeah. um, if it wasn't already doing so. Um, and, and it really, in a way, it proved to. I mean, you know, there's, there's several volumes just on the notes and everything that go along with, yeah. um, with the Lord of the Rings. Right. So, not to mention all the appendices that probably most people don't don't read um, okay. at the end of Lord of the Rings. So, yep. um, so if Leaf by Niggle, you know, if if we want to give it kind of that quick autobiographical approach, apparently there's two things that Tolkien admits. First is that there was a tree that he particularly loved that he was worried about, and then second of all, um, the Lord of the Rings was very much on his mind, and he sensed that it was becoming this thing that was just growing from this one little leaf, you know, of a, of a tail. Yeah. Um, you know, this one little Bilbo's new story, and it was growing from that into this whole, like, vast web of stories mm -hmm. that was, was, you know, really getting out of control. Gotcha. And he was anxious that as things were kind of getting worse in Europe at that time, that, hey, maybe he'd never have a chance to finish writing it. Right? Oh. So yeah. all of that is said... Um, as way of introduction to the story itself. So, um, let's do a quick time check. Um, you know, I think that's probably a good spot to go ahead and take a commercial break, okay. and we'll come back and actually discuss the story next. Awesome. So, let's do it. Yep, yeah, we'll be right back. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the Colonel of the Middle-Earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril one of the holy jewels of the blessed realm from the iron crown of the dark lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers. In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash B-E-R-E-N. Happy reading. As I said in the introduction to this episode, things didn't go quite as planned, and the conversation about the story itself took so long that it really deserves its own separate episode. Drop in again soon to hear our discussion of Leaf by Niggle. It's a beautiful story, so there's a whole lot to say. Thanks for listening.